But today we got a, a very special friend of ours, not friend, a family member here of our house, someone who spoke to us and he was up there at the camp with us as well. And he has a word for us as a church this morning. Can we give a big welcome, a big Wayworld Outreach welcome to Pastor Derek Faison. Let's give him a big round of applause. Come on, if it's not too early and you're not too tired, would you jump on your feet and give God your best praise right here? Come on, all the men that are at the retreat, where my dogs at? Make some noise in here. Now look, this little something I do in my church, maybe you don't do it here, but would you shake somebody by the hand and tell them, neighbor, I don't know about you, but God's been too good to me for me to be quiet about it. So you're gonna have to excuse me for a minute while I give my God a praise. Now go ahead and give him a praise. Praise him like you want to. Praise him like nobody looking at you. Amen, everyone, please be seated. I want to give our most profound respects to the angels of this house, Pastor Marco and Lisa Garcia. Come on, let's give God praise for them. Amen, and also the Pastor Armando and his lovely wife, amen. Man, they did an amazing job this weekend with the men's advance. Where are my men at? Make some noise. You, you still got some barking down in you somewhere? Make some noise, man. Raise the roof in this house. I bring you greetings from the Impact Church of Nashville. I am the senior pastor, and we're so glad that you had us here. Amen. My wife sends her profound respects and praise to all of you that are here on today. I want to jump right into the Word of God this morning and take advantage of the time that we have. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. And y'all got to forgive how I act because uh, when I come here, I feel like I'm home. See, I'm looking around some new faces. I don't know some of y'all, but I'm home. And you know, certain things you can do when you're home when you can't do nowhere else. So if I'm quirky, if I'm weird, if I'm a little bit off, just pray for me because I'm home. Look at somebody and say, this boy's home today. Yeah, kick my shoes off, get comfortable, put my feet up on the couch because I'm home. Amen? Look at Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to read out an NIV translation. They're going to put up the King James Version, so it may sound a little bit different from yours. But I'm going to read from the 14th to the 21st verse. Amen? And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falls into the fire and often he falls into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long will I suffer you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and they said, well, why couldn't we cast him out? Yeah. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. I want to drop back to verse 19 because it's that question that they gave to Jesus that the Lord uh, prompted me to talk to you about on this morning where it says the disciples came to Jesus apart after they couldn't cast out them. They said, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. And I'm going to use a little weird title this morning, but it's going to work for me. My title this morning is, Lord, it ain't working. This ain't working. It's going to make sense. That's why I look at somebody's face and say, Lord, this ain't working. Father, be big in this house today, in Jesus' name, amen. 
Listen, listen, I hate for things not to work the way they're supposed to. I hate it. It absolutely gets on my nerves. It's a pet peeve of mine. Maybe it's some of yours, but I don't like to have a car. I don't like to have a phone. I don't like to have a relationship. I don't like to have anything that don't work like it's supposed to. It's something about having something that I have great anticipation for and great uh, 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 expectation of. When it's not working, it gets on my absolute nerves. I can't rest. If my phone apps don't work, I can't rest. If my car starts acting funny, I can't rest. If I'm in a covenant relationship with you and we're kind of off, I can't rest. How many people know what I'm talking about? I can't rest. When things don't work where they're supposed to, I start brainstorming and I start troubleshoot, troubleshooting because I want it to work. How many other people feel that way too? Now, now, what I found out is that when something is not working like it's supposed to, what should you do with it if it's not working right? If it's not working like it was designed to operate? I found this out that when things are not working like they should, it's best to take it back to the manufacturer. Take it back to the person that created it. Take it back to the person that made it. Because who better to know how it's supposed to work than the person who created it? Who better to tell you how it's supposed to operate rather than be sitting up with silent frustration, brainstorming, walking the floor, getting mad, calling people because I'm working on something that's not supposed to work, that every once in a while you may have to take the thing that you have back to the person that made it, and the person who made it can now give you solutions so that you don't live in silent frustration. Now listen, in our text, the disciples are dealing with a similar dilemma, and here's why. Some of you will recall that when Jesus had given his disciples the power and authority to work miracles, he gave them power to work miracles, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out unclean spirits. And in the past, what they had was they had exercised this authority successfully. Because Jesus had given them the authority to, step up, to, to speak to demons and to cast them out, because he had taught them and trained them and showed them how to do it, they were comfortable and they knew how to do it. The issue was not them not knowing how to do it. The issue was not that. In fact, at one place, they began to brag and say, Lord, even the devils are subject to us. Through your name and through your power, we got the formula, we got the secret. We know how to make devils subjected to us. But here in our text is a curious situation because with all that training, with all of that authority, with all that power, here they were facing a boy who was tormented with an evil spirit. And look at this, y'all. They were completely powerless. And what do you do when what you used to do don't work for you? What do you do when you're used to shaking yourself like Samson and the anointing come upon you, but this time you shook yourself and nothing happens? And here, here's what they said. The verse said that they could not cast him out. It's not that they didn't try. It's not that they didn't put effort into it. That means they tried everything, but they were getting no results. And I come to talk to somebody who is trying everything, and you're getting no results. That many of you right now are living with that same frustration. That you're doing everything you know, and everything that you're supposed to do, trying to be a conscientious employee, trying to be a loving spouse, trying to be a watchful parent, living a holy life, being a faithful member, being a consistent tither, but still with all the things that you know that you're supposed to do, it still ain't working. You're still coming up short, still coming up empty, still coming up with no results, and I know how the saints are because we always like to pretend that we have victory when we don't. We have all these Christian cliches and colloquialism when you say, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm blessed and highly favored. Nobody wants to admit this ain't working. We like to wear a mask and we like to pretend and we like to put on a show in front of people. So I'm not here to talk to your mask this morning. I'm here to talk to some real people this morning who are willing to put down your mask and put aside your title and put aside all your fronts and your faces and just be honest like you are at the doctors and say, Lord, this ain't working. 
I'm living right, but it ain't working. I'm praying, but y'all not going to talk to me. It's the, it's the 9 o'clock crowd. Y'all sleepy. I'm, I'm giving, but it ain't working. I'm coming home like I'm supposed to, but it ain't working. Is there anybody in here who knows the frustration of doing everything you're supposed to do and it still don't work? Let me talk to this side of the room. Is there anybody over here who knows what it's like to put your best foot forward to give something your best efforts and still get no results. Lord, this ain't working. I know it's supposed to. I know we're supposed to have it. I know I'm supposed to have the victory. I know everybody around me is getting it, but for some reason, for me, this ain't working. It's driving me crazy. Now for the disciples who were used to having success, this was a disappointing and humiliating experience. It's one thing for you to fail in private. It's another thing for you to fail in public. It's one thing for you to testify about what God's gonna do and he does it, but what do you do when you told everybody God was gonna do it and it didn't happen? I told everybody I was gonna get that job and I didn't get it. I bragged about the strength of my marriage and it failed. I told everybody that I had the victory over the situation and I look up and I'm now struggling with the thing that I once bragged I had the victory. Y'all not going to talk to me this morning. Y'all looking nervous. And though I put on a great front for you, when I go in the back, when I get by myself, I have to have a conversation with God and say, God, why is this not working? You told me that I had power over demons. You told me that if I name it and claim it, that I would receive it. You told me that if I give my tithes, that the windows of heaven would open. But for some reason, I'm doing the right things, but I'm not getting the right results. And it's driving me crazy. This ain't working. So they brought this demoniac child to the disciples. And the disciples did everything they could. Loose you here. I bind you. I'm pleading the blood. You know how we do. Hey, loose here in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you. But nothing it was happening. He's still growling. He's still got demonic spirits. And now you got a crowd around you looking at you. Because everybody knew that you were a disciple. Everybody knew that you were a believer. Everybody knew because of how braggadocious you were that you were a disciple of Jesus. And I just wanted to see for myself if the, if the rumors were true that you really had power. And so there you are uh, in a standoff with all these unbelievers and nothing is happening. How humiliating, how embarrassing, how disappointing it was. Beloved, in a lot of ways... This scene represents the condition of the modern church. Because people come to church expecting to find help, to find hope, and to find healing for the ills of their life, and rightly so. Because think about it, if I take my car to a mechanic, I'm expecting him to know what to do. Come on, somebody. If I'm sick and I go to a doctor, I'm expecting him who has been experienced and trained in this sort of thing to know what to do. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm having a problem and I'm having issues and I go to a counselor, I'm expecting them because of their background and their training and their experience that they would tell me the secret to getting the victory over the situation. I'm expecting them to know what to do. And so in the same way, people come to church expecting us to offer solutions. That's why they come to church. They come with issues, they come with problems, they come with challenges. And somebody somewhere told them that if you just come to church, if you just come to the way, if you just come and hear the pastor speak, that they're going to say something that's going to change your life. So I came in this morning because I came with my issue. And I know, even as a believer, we all have issues. I came with problems, I came with challenges. Oh, I hate to bust somebody's bubble, but I didn't come to see you. I didn't come to be seen. When I came in here, I came because I needed to get a word from God. I didn't come because I needed to be seen. I didn't come to be famous. I didn't come because I needed somebody to dress up and go. I came to get a word from God. If you came to get a word from God, would you shout, I came to get a word? I can't get happy yet. I can't get happy yet. 
So people come. You look around this room, everybody's dressed up and everybody's looking good and everybody's smelling good, but I have enough sense to know that people come with issues. That anywhere you see humanity, where you see flesh, people come in here with problems. You can't see it because they're all dressed up and they're all uh, nice and they're smelling all good. But underneath of that thin veneer are problems that people can't talk about and issues at home. And for somebody, I barely got here this morning because I came through something just to get here. I had to step over top of something just to get in the room. That's why I don't want you bothering me when I'm getting in my worship. Because you don't know what I had to come through just to get here. I don't want you passing me no notes and calling me and texting me because I came because I needed God to speak to my situation. You can be cute if you want to, and you can sit there like you came to a movie theater, but I came to get me a word from God, and before I leave, I'm going to get what I need. If that's you, jump up and say, I came to get it. This is why people come to church. But sadly, when they came to the church, to the disciples expecting solutions, they were powerless. And the disappointment with many churches in America is that people come in droves, but they are powerless. People come in depressed and they leave depressed. They come in bound and they leave bound. They come in suicidal and they leave suicidal because I hate to say it, but many of our churches are powerless. That many of them brag with a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. But thankfully, thankfully, they brought the issue to Jesus. And here comes Jesus. And what I like about God is our inability does not stop him from being powerful. That just because, I'm going to talk to somebody who has an issue with church, with church people who say that God's people ain't nothing. Listen, just because you see flaws in God's people does not negate the power of the God we serve. Just because I may be having issues, he don't have no issues. Just because I may be going through a simple, temporary financial situation, my God is never broke. He is never powerless. He is never without authority. And you might see me struggle, but the God I serve, he never struggles. He never has an issue. He never wrings his hands and he's worried about what's going to happen. Look at somebody and say, my God can do anything. So here comes Jesus walking on the scene and he quickly resolves the situation that we wrestle with. That's the God that we serve. He can come in and do in a moment what took you five years to get through. Somebody here is a witness that I, I was wrestling with an issue. I was wrestling with an addiction. I was wrestling with a problem. But the moment I came and God spoke to me, I was delivered. I was healed. I was set free. If you're a witness to the power of God, give God a shout right here. It might be too early for you. So they wrestled. They bargained. They were powerless. But the moment Jesus walked in the room, he immediately resolved in a moment what they could not fix. Cast out the unclean spirit. And the boy was set free from that very moment. It's a testimony to the power of our God. But but, but, but listen, listen, I'm glad that Jesus came in and fixed the whole situation. But it begs the question, y'all, um, why couldn't we drive him out? I've been endued with the authority of Jesus' name. I gave the right formula. I spoke in the, heavenly, in the heavenly name, the name that everybody respects, and I didn't get results. And it begs the question, why couldn't we, the disciples, the followers, the tithe givers, the tongue talkers, the prayer warriors, why couldn't we fix the situation? And in churches today, quite honestly, we're, we're missing something. We're missing something. We're missing something very important. Because we know that God can do anything but fail. That he has never lost a case. That he has never lost a fight. That God is all powerful. So whenever there is a power failure, 
I must surmise that the issue cannot be with him. The issue must be with me. That if we're in a situation where we call on the name of the Lord and we're standing against something that is standing against us and we know that nothing can withstand the power of our God, I must surmise that there's nothing wrong with him. There's got to be something wrong with me. Where, where, where am I missing it? Where am I missing it? One rich friend looter asked this question. He said, Lord, what can I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, he said, I was doing everything I'm supposed to do. And Jesus said this, one thing you're lacking. In his particular case, he had to give up his love of possessions. He had to sell what he had and give it to the poor. And the Bible said that the rich young ruler walked away and was grieved because he had great possessions. That he was one thing away from having everything he could ever want. And some of you right now, you got that one thing that's keeping you from having the life that you want. It's always that one thing, y'all, that's got you tripping. It's not several things. It's, it's always that one thing. I got this right. I got that right. I do that right. But it's always that one thing. Everybody's got one thing that keeps them from being as effective as they could be. Let me ask you a question. What's your one thing? What's your, what's your one thing? I know you got this right, and you got that right, and you're crossing your T's and you're dotting your I's, but everybody's got that one thing. Yeah. The Bible talks about laying aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset you, that everybody has the sin. Not talking about sins, but everybody's got that one thing. Yeah. It may be a secret thing. It may be something that nobody knows about. It may not be something that you admit to. That when I get ready to do what God has called me to do, the enemy has a way of bringing up that one thing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That you can be powerful and you can be effective and you can be uh, uh, getting things done over here. But every time you really decide to go forward, the devil reminds you of that one thing. Paul said this, he said, lay aside every weight and the sin that besets you. So this was a teaching moment. For some people, what's your one thing? For some people, it could be pride. It could be lust. It could be fear. It could be envy. But everybody in here has got a thing. Everybody in here has got that one thing. I, I, I could be effective if it wasn't for this one thing. Yeah, I got the men in the back. They understand what I'm saying. We've been talking all weekend. I, I, I could be more powerful if it wasn't for this one thing. I, I, I could be effective in the hands of the master if it wasn't for this one anger. I, I'm normally a nice person, but that anger of mine always gets in the way. I could be effective, but it's just that one thing, that one attitude, that one lust that stops me from being who I was supposed to be. And it was causing, listen, y'all, a power failure. So for Jesus, this power failure was a teaching moment. I'm so glad we serve a God who doesn't just trash you when you don't do everything just right. That he doesn't throw you aside and disqualify you and cancel out everything that you, this is how Christians get on my nerves because you can do a thousand things right and do one thing wrong and they will cancel everything you did right. Y'all not talking to me for the one thing you did wrong. Some of you are victims right now of people who remember everything you did wrong and don't remember anything you did right. I was there for you, I supported you, I ministered to you, I helped you, I came for you, but I did one thing you don't agree with and you're ready to throw the whole thing in the trash, trash the whole ministry, trash the whole marriage, walk away from the whole church because one usher in the back didn't speak to you right and you cancel everything that God has done in your life because of one thing. Look at somebody say, what's your one thing? But Jesus decided to use this as a teaching moment. And so in the next 10 minutes, I want to show you the power failure that they had, which may help you with the power failure that you may be having in your life. Number one, Jesus was teaching them the necessity of faith. When they asked Jesus why it didn't work, Jesus said, because of your unbelief, Beloved, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we all have moments and bouts of faith, right? We all have moments where we don't cling to our faith like we're supposed to. Where we have to pray like one man said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. 
Is there anybody that can be honest at this 9 o'clock service and say, sometimes I don't believe like I'm supposed to believe. And I need God to help my unbelief. I need God to help me believe for things that I can't believe. I, I need God to step in. Lord, I need you to help me to get my mind around it. I'm in a battle. I'm in a fight. I'm having an issue, and it looks like the enemy is winning. Is there anybody who's ever been in something that was so terrible, that was so frightening, that was so scary, that it tested your faith? I know there's nobody in here. Everybody here full of faith, ain't there? Everybody. I'm going to find some folks in here who's ever had a battle who've ever been in a faith fight where you weren't sure how it was going to come out? Have you ever been in a faith fight where sometimes you got the enemy by the neck and sometimes he's got you by the neck and we're not quite sure how this thing is going to work out? It depends on what day you catch me. Sometimes I got a grip on him. Sometimes he got a grip on me because this is a faith fight. This ain't no faith vacation. This ain't no faith resort. This is a faith fight. And when you're in a fight, sometimes they get a lick in on you, but sometimes you get a lick in on them. But I'm determined that I am going to win this fight. If you're in a faith fight and you're determined you're going to win, jump on your feet and say, I will I know, I know. Some of you are sitting there, and you don't want to acknowledge that I'm telling the truth because you have to keep up your facade. I don't want anybody to believe that I would ever have issues with my faith. I always believe God. But, but listen, even Jesus' disciples sometimes, he had to rebuke his own disciples and say, Oh, you of little faith. Sometimes we're trying to sell something that we don't believe ourselves. Don't sell me something that doesn't work for you. And sometimes you're trying to convince people to believe something that you don't believe yourself. I got eight minutes to get to the rest of this message. Number two, I want to talk to you about the necessity of consecration. Jesus said this. He said, this kind goes out only by prayer and fasting. He said, this kind, which distinguishes it from other kinds of attacks from the enemy. Beloved, Satan is always busy. He's always at work. But there are some problems, some situations, some obstacles, certain forces that require a little more effort. In other words, a little dab won't do you. Just coming to a morning service and getting a word is not going to do you. That you're going to have to press in and, to, and go into, into DEFCON mode, DEFCON 6 mode. That you're not going to be able to walk into this kind of fight with a little bit of prayer and a little bit of praise. That sometimes you're going to just got to go slap off, off. That sometimes when you get in a faith fight, you got to get in the kind of fight where you take down your hair. That ain't nobody in here. See, the problem with Christians is we want a cute fight. We want a nice fight. We, we want to get in a fight and come out looking pretty. But every once in a while, you get into a fight, you get into a battle over one of your kids, or get into a battle over your marriage, or get into a financial struggle, and you ain't got time to be pretty, and you ain't got time to be cute, and you ain't got time to worry about who's looking at you, and you ain't got time to worry about what kind of shoes you got on, and you ain't got time to worry about what nobody think about you. I just got to get this fight. I got to win this fight. And I need about 200 of y'all who don't care what nobody think to jump up on your feet and say, I'm in a fight. I'm in a fight. I'm in a fight. There are certain things that can only be overcome with fasting and prayer. I know the modern church don't believe in fasting and prayer. But there are certain things that you can only overcome through fasting and prayer. Jesus taught us an example. Every once in a while, he would steal away alone to pray. Every once in a while, he would just get with the Father. Every once in a while, he came away from the crowd. He came away from the friends. He came away from his disciples, and he got alone with God. I'm coming to talk to somebody about the power of consecration. 
We don't talk too much about consecration nowadays. Everything we do, we got to go with somebody. Got to take my prayer warrior. Got to take my best friend. Got to take my girlfriend. We can't even serve without taking a selfie. We can't even operate without somebody seeing it. We got to put everything on social media. I'm eating chicken. I'm washing my dishes. I'm walking the dog. We got to put everything out where everybody can see it. But every once in a while, you got to get old school. And you got to get into consecration. And you got to come away from everybody and get along with God. Hang up the phone and get off the Facebook and get along with God. I'm not being funny. I'm not being weird, but I need God to do something in my life and I got to get along with God. With all the crowds and all the throngs and all the knees, every once in a while Jesus would slip away and be with the mass with God. But when he came back, he came back with power. And is it possible that some of us are powerless because you are prayerless? And you can't be prayerless all week and expect to have power. Look at somebody say, you have to pray for this one. This is a faith fight. And you can't fight spiritual battles using carnal weapons. And you can't cast out of somebody else what's alive in you. Oh, y'all ain't ready for me at 9 o'clock. It's the wrong crowd. You try to rebuke devils out of me, but you ain't got the devils out of yourself. You got to get along with God. Get off the Facebook and get in the book. Get away from your friends and get along with God. Some things you're going to have to fast and pray. Last thing and I'm done. I want to talk to you about the, the necessity of humility. Here was the question that the disciples asked Jesus. Why weren't we able to do this? Why couldn't we do this? And that's the problem. That's the problem. Because it wasn't you in the first place. <laughs> it was the God in you that the demons respected. The demons don't respect you. They respect the God that lives in you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the problem is you're trying to do stuff in your own strength. And no wonder it don't work because you keep thinking it's you and not him. Oh, God. Jesus said this. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. I'm the main thing. I'm the thing that all the power flows through. I'm the thing you get the strength from. I'm the thing you get the power from. You are the branches. You are the outflow. You are the extension of what I am. And you can do nothing without me. No more than you can do anything. No more than the, than the vine can do anything without the vine. No more can the branches do anything without the vine. You can do nothing without me. And the problem is you're trying to do spiritual things in your own strength. And wonder why it's not working. You're trying to do things in your own wisdom and wonder why it's not working. But you got to get down and say, Lord, I need you. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. I, I've been preaching all weekend, but I, I feel like I had to drop this off before I go back to Nashville. God said to tell somebody, for this next fight, you got to step back and let me do what I do. That I'm going to rise up in you and I'm going to scatter every enemy and scatter every foe. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Is there anybody in here that need God to stand up in your life? I dare you to open your mouth and say, God, come on in. Flex your muscles. Throw your weight around. Do what you do. Demons are getting nervous right now. Demons are getting scared right now. There's a witch right now that's nervous right now because I just peeped your card. You've been trying to use me for my own strength, but I feel a God rising up. The power is in your connection. You're trying to stay connected to people and it ain't working for you. But I need a connection with God. I need God to connect with me. And when you get God. Slap about 
all three people say, I'm connected, I'm connected, I'm connected, I'm connected. You look at me and you think it's me, it's the God in me. You think I'm successful because of my degree, it's the God in me. You think I'm winning because I'm smart, it's the God in me. Is there anybody in here who can testify, it's the God? I gotta get out of here. It's the God in me. It's the God in me. Back up, devil. It's the God. The reason the church many times is ineffective is because we lost our connection. We're trying to be powerful through politics. We're trying to be powerful through social influence. We're trying to be powerful through the number of degrees we have. But every once in a while, God will let all the things you trust in fall down. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of our God. If you're in here and you're trusting in the name of your God, would you give God a shout like you lost your mind? For somebody who's lost sight of your connection, who's lost sight of the fact that it's God in you and it's not you. I want to tell you that powerless men become powerful once they make the corrections in their life. That if you're in a place in your life where you're failing or you're losing or you're not having the results you have, all is not lost. You don't have to quit. You don't have to walk away. You just got to get back plugged in. And I remember you when you used to be a prayer warrior, but now you don't pray like you're supposed to. You got to get back plugged in. I remember this church when all you had to do was say the name of Jesus and the whole place would blow up. But now you got cute and now you got pretty and now you got sophisticated. But everybody who's ready to go back to just call it on the name my old school saints said that don't mind giving God a praise. My reckless soul, my crazy radical folk. I'm going to say this and sit down. You got to make some corrections. You make the corrections. There is nothing wrong with having course correction. That every once in a while you're going in a path and you get off the path and you're not getting the results you used to have, and you're not having the things you used to have, and you're not having the victory that you're supposed to have. See, here's the problem, my brother. I don't understand why you can have a power failure and it don't bother you. That's the problem with the church. It's not that we lost power. It don't bother us that we've lost power. It don't bother us that a demon can be standing right next to you and shouting when you shout. But something in you ought to rise up and say, not today, devil. If you're sitting next to a devil, something in you on the inside ought to rise up and say, I'm going to cast this thing out in the net. Oh, my God. If you've had the course correct and make corrections, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back and try it again. Go back and try it again. That correction is not designed to kill you, but to strengthen you. And if God wants to correct a behavior in your life, it's designed so that you can be successful. So what you gotta do is go back and do what the manufacturer told you to do. The thing wasn't working, that's why you brought it to him. You got to bring your marriage to the one who created marriage. You got to bring your kids to the God who gave you the kids. You got to bring your ministry to the God who gave you the ministry. And if you give it back to the God that gave you the ministry, God said, now I want you to go back and try it again. I'm going to sit down on this. God said to tell somebody, when you go back this time, it's going to work. I'm out of here. When you go back this time, it's going to work. I know your kids been showing out, but when you go back this time, it's going to work. The business is going to work. The ministry is going to work. The marriage is going to work. I want every radical person in here that believes that God's going to give you the victory. Find you about five people and tell them it's going to work. I 
I don't know what your it is. I don't know what you've been battling with, but God said to tell you I'm with you, and this time, I know you failed before, but this time, tell every devil and tell every demon I'm coming back, and this time, somebody show you. This time it's gonna work. This time it's gonna work. You've been holding back on your praise. You've been laying back waiting to see if it's gonna happen. But God said to tell somebody, if you praise me now, I'm gonna let that thing come down. I dare you to open your mouth. The devil say praise don't work, but I dare you to open your mouth. Walls are coming down. Demons are being cast out. Healing is going forth. Deliverance is coming forth. Open your mouth and shout, yeah! Lift your hands. Lift your hands right here. Lift your hands right here. Lift your hands right here in worship. For some of you, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from. I came to do something with the men. And the Lord said, you can't leave the city till you drop off this mail. I want to talk to somebody whose life has been failing and falling. And God said to tell you, if you go back to the things that you used to do, this time it's going to work. Go back to prayer. Go back to study. Go back to worship. Go back to praise. When was the last time that you lifted your hands and worshiped me until tears came down your face and you didn't even care what nobody thought? When was the last time that you worshiped before God and you wasn't trying to be prestigious and fancy and famous? And God said, if you go back to the things that work, I promise you. Father, all over this building are people who are struggling, who are struggling. For somebody, you're on your last leg. You came into this church and they didn't even know that you were this far from giving up. I'm speaking against a suicidal spirit in here right now. I'm speaking against somebody who's about to walk out on your marriage. Counseling didn't work. Friends didn't work. Everything you tried didn't work. And you're about to walk away from, but God said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm about to correct the things that you can't fix. And if you bring it back to me, it's not supposed to work without me. It's not supposed to. And I, I just want to pray. Just lift your hands. I just want to pray. Father, all over this room are needs. There are issues. There are challenges. Some are spoken. Some are unspoken. But they're in here. Things we can't talk about. Things we can't even bring up. But I'm praying today by the power of the Holy Ghost that they would get the strength, that they would get the courage to go back to the one who made it and say, Lord, it's broken. It's not working. It's not getting good results. But I know if I give it to you, that you have the power to change it. And so change it, Lord. Change that mind. Change that heart. Change that spirit. Change that life. And we're not even going to wait for you to do it before we give you praise. We're going to praise you now and let you do it later in Jesus' name. Everybody that agrees with that, give God a shout right here. Come on, if you receive it, give God a shout right here in Jesus' name. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that word today. Lord, this ain't working. You can remain standing right now and we're gonna get ready to dismiss, but before we do, we wanna give you an opportunity to respond to this call. Maybe in your life right now, you feel exactly that way, that you've been trying to do things, but it just hasn't been working for you. And maybe you're saying this, this whole God thing, before anyone else leaves, before anyone else leaves, you're saying, I don't know. I don't know where I'm at with God. You know, the Bible talks about it. It says that, puts us all in the same playing field. It says that all have fallen short of the glorious standard of God. That's just a real fancy way to say that we've all sinned and we've all messed up. 
How many know that we've all messed up? We've all made mistakes. But because of our sin, the Bible says, the wage or the price that we owe is death. In other words, that the price that we're supposed to pay because of the sins we've committed is eternal separation from God. Eternally separated from God forever in hell, not in heaven, in hell because of our sin. So then where's the hope? If all of us have sinned and we owe this price, what then do we do? Where is our hope at? And that's where God came in with his love. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God literally sent his son and Jesus willingly gave his life to pay your debt. And to pay the price that you and I owe. The price is on your head still until we willingly put our faith in Jesus as our Lord, as our Savior, as our Redeemer, as the one who purchased our freedom, until we repent and we turn away from our old lifestyle, we give everything to God, we still owe that price. But I'm here to encourage you today, I have good news for you. God is calling you. God is calling you into forgiveness. He's calling you into salvation. And he's calling you into eternal life. He wants to give this to you. All it takes from you is not trying to leave and be a good person. It just takes you confessing your faith in Jesus, repenting of your sin, and giving your life to him today. Today is your day. Don't wait for tomorrow. We do not know if tomorrow's promise. We don't know if we're going to live another day. We don't know where tomorrow is going to hold for us. But today can be a day where you can say, I'm going to be saved. I want to give my life to Jesus. And I want to know if I were to die today, I'd spend eternity with God in heaven forever. And I would not be separated from him because Jesus paid my debt. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, you want to give your life to Jesus. When I count to three, I just want you to raise your hand all over this room. Just put your hand up. One two three raise your hands raise your hands i see all those hands i see all those hands over here i see those hands in the back i see you up here i see you all those hands in the back i see you over here i see you over here to my left if you raise your hand can you do one more bold thing for me can you make your way out of your seat we have a whole team up here that wants to pray with you why don't you come up if you came with a friend or a family member friend or family member encourage them come up with them come up with them Come on, church, let's give them a round of applause. Let's celebrate. Let's clap for this moment. Come on, they're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Amen. This is for everyone that just came up. You're making a decision that's going to change your life forever. You're deciding now, from now on, your life no longer belongs to you, belongs to the Lord. But this is a great thing about that. Is that God will never ask you to give him something without giving you something in return. You're, give, you're giving up your whole life, but he's giving you his everything. Everything that God has, all his blessings, all his strength all his peace, all his, all his life, everything that he has is yours now. Give everything to God. Don't hold anything back. Any pain in your heart, any confusion, any, any addiction, it's okay. You can rest it at his feet. And God is going to give you life, and he's giving you salvation today by, because you're putting your faith in Jesus.